The world we live in, we share with countless forms of life, some more familiar than others. While some life forms have scarcely been affected by the human being, others have been changed profoundly, both genetically and behaviorally. Wild animals have always survived on instinct. They have evolved over thousands, even millions of years, to the point where their hunting skills or defense tactics have become extremely effective. Domestic animals, on the other hand, have been living with people for so long that they've lost many of the instincts that at one time made them wild. They've also experienced changes in their bones, brains, teeth, and reproduction cycles. Domestication of the dog probably began some 12,000 years ago when primitive humans and the remarkably intelligent wolf shared common hunting grounds. Both groups had similar social structures, living in families or packs headed by a single leader. Both groups competed for the same food and had a history of stealing from each other over a period of thousands of years. Very likely, humans started occasionally adopting wolf pups that had been either orphaned or that they had dug out of a den. Those animals that didn't exhibit the wolf's normal wild temperament but were relatively docile were selected to be mated with a similar animal from one's neighbor. Hence, some of the very first companion animals. Over a period of many more years, people continued breeding and crossbreeding, what was now evolving into the domesticated dog. Distinct breeds were created for different purposes, for protecting one's home turf, including the tribal flock, for hunting different types of animals, pulling heavy loads, for herding sheep and cattle, and, of course, for providing companionship. Compared to dogs, cats were domesticated relatively recently, some 4,000 years ago, by the Egyptians. Wild cats were attracted to towns by the mice and rats that thrived in early human settlements. As an agricultural society, the Egyptians welcomed the cat as a protector of their huge grain stores. Eventually, cats in Egypt came to be regarded as sacred, as objects of worship, and enjoyed free run of the house. When the animals died, they were mummified and buried in consecrated ground. Most of today's cats are direct descendants of the African wildcat and the European forest wildcat. For thousands of years, the domesticated dog and cat have provided people with companionship, devotion, and unconditional love. In turn, most pet owners have provided their animals with a safe, loving, non-threatening environment. Because the dog and cat are no longer part of a natural ecosystem, living in balance with the rest of nature, they simply cannot survive for very long on their own. Dogs and cats have evolved into companion animals 
that rely directly upon human beings. They depend on us to make the right choices for them. They depend on us to give them the right food, to provide proper shelter, veterinary care, including vaccinations once a year, to make sure they're always wearing ID tags, and that they're on a leash when they're outside the home. They depend on us to control their reproduction through spaying or neutering, to give them obedience training when they're old enough, to keep them neatly groomed. In short, to simply ensure their general well-being. It's when the human being fails to fulfill his or her responsibilities as a pet owner that animals get into trouble. Originally, humane societies had relatively little to do with dogs and cats. In the 19th century, horses were the primary mode of transportation. These horses were often overburdened, cruelly overworked, and many died in the harness. Across the country, concerned citizens began banding together to form humane societies to help protect these animals. At about the same time, there was another group that was often being abused and mistreated. Children were commonly sold into forced labor and often abandoned or beaten. Humane societies took up the torch on their behalf as well, invoking the spirit of the very laws that had been established to protect animals. As more laws were passed to specifically help protect children, and once the car began replacing the horse as the preferred means of transport, humane societies turned their full attention to the companion animal issues they still address today. Overpopulation, cruelty, neglect. In the receiving departments of shelters across the country, animals are turned in every day for any number of reasons. Most of the reasons given simply indicate that a person or a family wasn't ready to commit to their pet for life. The dog is untrainable, keeps biting and scratching. The cat keeps jumping on the furniture. The kids have outgrown the dog. The dog's outgrown the kids. We didn't know he'd turn out so big. We're moving but can't find an apartment that will take dogs. We can't find anybody to take the new kittens. We're leaving on vacation, but can't find anybody to sit with her. My roommate's allergic to cats. I can't afford to keep them anymore. The dog barks too much. The dog doesn't bark enough. He's become too friendly to strangers. Some of us might try to keep a pet in an apartment building where no pets are allowed. One day, the landlord finds out and threatens eviction of the whole family if the animal isn't given up. Time for two friends to say goodbye. This good Samaritan has taken the trouble to bring in a stray dog she picked up before it could get hurt or cause a traffic accident. Other animals that come in have been severely abused. Dogs with broken bones. Cats that have been set on fire. Animals that have been tied up and abandoned. Could this dog have been abused by his owner? Or did he fall into the wrong hands because he wasn't kept in a fenced yard or inside the home? Could he be the unwanted offspring of a pet that was irresponsibly allowed to reproduce? Dr. Randy Lockwood of the Humane Society of the United States. A lot of animal cruelty comes from people's need for power, the need to control something to feel that they're in control of their own world. Animals help teach us that sympathy and compassion is a very effective way of influencing others. 
Animals help teach us that violence only begets more violence. You have to wonder how anyone could hurt or torture an animal. Sometimes these are simply people who've never learned to love any other living thing. But sometimes these are kids who have been abused themselves, and sometimes their abuser has killed or hurt their animal as a way of further controlling them. Kids who have lost an animal in this way sometimes hurt animals to convince themselves that what they've lost they didn't really love. Not all abuse or neglect is a result of malicious intent. Simple ignorance on the part of the pet owner can sometimes bring just as much harm to an animal. This Cocker Spaniel went without grooming for over a year, but was lucky enough to be rescued before his condition became life-threatening. While the heavy matting of his coat has made it hard for him to get around, he's still reasonably healthy and will be given a second chance with a more responsible owner. Other examples of neglect through ignorance include the dog that's left outdoors in all types of weather without adequate shelter, or the cat that's allowed to roam free and ends up in the middle of a truly life-threatening situation, running into other animals, racing across road traffic, ingesting poisons. By the time the pet owner realizes his or her mistake, it could be too late. Euthanasia is a word that sometimes conjures up confusion, anger, frustration, a word that's often misunderstood. Euthanasia can be defined as a painless death or the act of causing death painlessly to end suffering, for example. It takes a trained professional technician, usually working with a partner, to humanely and compassionately euthanize an animal. Some animals are brought in to be euthanized because they're suffering from serious illness or have become debilitated with the effects of old age. In such cases, the responsible pet owner realizes this is the most loving, humane thing he or she can now do. But then why do we have to euthanize all those other animals that are perfectly healthy? The human being, specifically the irresponsible pet owner, by not making the right choices, has allowed the dog and cat to breed uncontrollably. Some people even choose to just let their animals go free. But dogs and cats running loose in wooded areas, alleys, parks, and in the streets aren't free at all. They've never been in more danger their entire lives. They get hit by cars, slowly starve, dehydrate or freeze to death, ingest poison, suffer from wounds received in fights with other animals, even suffer and die at the hands of abusive people. Surely, a painless humane death is kinder and preferable to a life cut short by unbearable agony and suffering. Because there are far too many dogs and cats for the number of good homes available, and because even the largest shelters can't contain the overflow of unwanted pets, millions of healthy animals must be euthanized every year. It's important to remember that euthanasia is not a solution to the overpopulation problem. It's a symptom of the problem. So how do we solve the problem itself? How can we avoid this tragic dilemma altogether? Would we be watching this dog being euthanized if his mother and father had been spayed and neutered in the first place? Should we be angry at those who day after day have to deal with other people's thoughtless mistakes? It's, it's, very, it's very hard to make that decision for a lot of these animals that do come in. It takes a lot out of you, realizing you're holding this animal in your hands and, and then the life just goes that, that quick and that fast. And it's really sad, you know. 
but um, when you do it so many years though, it's very hard to do because um, people don't realize how an animal feels though when you hold this animal when it's when it's dying. It's feeling this your hands around them, holding them, caressing them, and trying to comfort this animal. There's so many of them. One way to solve the overpopulation problem is to turn our anger and frustration into action. To realize that the solution begins with each one of us. Hi, can I help you? I have an appointment to spray my dog. What's your name? The first thing we can do is make sure that our own animals are spayed or neutered. Secondly, we can encourage any of our friends who have cats or dogs to get their animals spayed or neutered too. Spaying and neutering are simple operations that prevent dogs and cats from reproducing. Females are spayed, males are neutered. Once they've had the operation, the animals are calmer, more affectionate, and far less likely to contract the most common types of cancer. Females no longer go into heat, and males no longer want to escape from the house or yard in search of females. Neutered males are also much less likely to mark their territory by urinating on walls or in the house. But listen up, you've got to make that choice. If you don't choose that, your cat's not going to call up the vet and say, I want to be spayed because I'm really bugging my family here. That's something you've got to do. Because if you choose not to spay or neuter your cat, again, they don't get pregnant by accident, really. Okay, they don't have these babies by accident. You have to choose whether or not you're going to halt their reproduction. Remember that just one unneutered male can be responsible for making several females pregnant in a very short time. Each pregnant cat and the offspring could produce over a period of seven years a total of 420,000 cats. Each female dog in the offspring could produce over six years a total of 67,000 dogs. Finally, if you know of someone who's thinking of getting a pet, you should convince them to adopt from the local animal shelter. They'll discover a wide selection of healthy, well-adjusted animals. And after meeting with an adoption counselor, might just walk away with a new friend for life. It's easy to think of the millions of dogs and cats that suffer and die every year as just a number. But each and every animal involved has a story. Each dog and cat is a living, breathing, sentient being that depends directly upon us. Because we domesticated them, it's our responsibility to care and provide for them. If we start making the right choices, if you guys make the right choices, rather than be adding to the problems, start choosing to be part of the solution. The first way to be part of the solution to any problem is to not add to it, of course. If we choose not to recognize our responsibility, if we allow animals to suffer, what justice and care are we showing other less fortunate groups, like homeless people, or victims of abuse? We become truly compassionate when we recognize ourselves in other beings, human or non-human, and simply treat others as we ourselves would want to be treated. By volunteering even a few hours a week towards helping any group less fortunate than we are. For example, working with people in need, helping them build affordable housing, or spending a Saturday doing volunteer work in your local animal shelter. We each do our part to build a better world for everyone. We tend to judge people by the way we see them interact with animals, and I think that makes sense. 
Someone who can extend their compassion and sympathy to an animal or to the world itself can extend that same kind of sympathy and compassion to their fellow human beings. It's in our power, in each of us as individuals, to make choices that either help or hurt the world around us and those we share it with. The choice is ours. <laughs>